Hey everyone, welcome to Always Good News. My name is Mark Miller and I'm so glad that uh, you've taken some time to join us for another episode. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe so you don't miss any of the upcoming content. And uh, hey, we always love to know where you're watching from, so please do us a favor and participate with us. Just write uh, in the comment box there exactly uh, maybe where you're watching from, what city you live in, what country, what province, if you're here in Canada. And uh, we always love to, uh, to see and hear where people are tuning in from, from all over Canada, but also all over the world. And also there's a question box there on the bottom if you want to submit a question. Uh, we may be able to get to that at some point as well uh, during our conversation tonight. Welcome. Good to see Julia. Uh, we've got somebody watching from the United States. Welcome. Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. Welcome. Robbins, North Carolina. That's awesome. Any Canadians on yet? Welcome. Good to have all of you. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, we're going to have a great conversation tonight. By the way, all of uh, the previous episodes can be found on the Billy Graham Canada uh, YouTube channel or on IGTV. So feel free to check any of those out. That's good to have you again with us, Dave. Dave, you're always so faithful to watch each week. Nice to have you. Listen, so we're going to jump in in just a minute. Um, I want to give you three reasons. I just did this as a lead up to going live. Uh, but three reasons or three things you're going to get out of tonight. If you've ever participated in Operation Christmas Child, uh, the shoe boxes with Samaritan's Purse, and you've wondered, you know, does this really make a difference? I think this conversation tonight and our guest is going to shed some light on uh, exactly the difference that it does make. If you've never participated, you don't know what Operation Christmas Child is, or if you've heard about it and you've got your doubts and you wonder, you know, does giving a shoe box to a child somewhere else in the world make any kind of difference? Um, you're going to want to stick around. And then lastly, um, you know, we've all, we all go through stuff in life and we get hurt. Uh, people hurt us and there's things that we need to offer forgiveness. And sometimes offering forgiveness is really tough. I think tonight's story is going to just encourage you. If there is something that you need to um, express forgiveness and give forgiveness to somebody, um, tonight uh, is going to be a, a, another reminder of the power of forgiveness and the redemption uh, that comes through that. Hey, Ron, good to see you as well. Well, usually um, I give an introduction to our guest, but tonight I'm going to jump right into our conversation and add our guest uh, to go live um, because I think I just want to give him as much time to share with us tonight as possible. This is going to be really powerful. Stick around, everybody. Hey, Alex. Hey, how are you? I'm um, doing well. Good to have you. Hey, everybody that's watching, meet my friend Alex uh, Senjimana. Did I get it? Yeah, 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 yeah. you nailed it. Yeah. Awesome. Senjimana. Alex is a, um, you're going to hear his story tonight. Alex, we usually um, give a big intro for everybody, but tonight I want you to share your story and give you as much time as possible uh, to share with all of our friends that are watching. Um, so we're going to jump into that in just a minute. But before we do, I don't know. Yeah. I know you've watched before, so you know what's coming. This is this or that. You ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm going to give you two options. You pick the best okay. option for you, and then people will get to know Alex. Here we go. Early mornings or late nights? Definitely out early mornings. I love my mornings with my cup right. of coffee. I love All right. You've got to be a coffee yeah. drinker. Early mornings is your choice. Yeah. Okay, what about this one? Hiking or swimming? Ooh. I would say hiking, definitely hiking, because I, uh, um, I, I'm not a good swimmer. If I don't, I don't have to tread water. So if I don't move forward, I move down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's stick with hiking. Uh, yeah. What about this, uh, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate, all okay. the way, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate, okay. Yeah. Um, they actually say dark chocolate's good for you. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's a chocolate fun. maker that tells us that. Yeah. Uh, what about a movie or a book? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I would say, I, I would say half and half, but I would le lean more to, if it's a good movie, I would lean more to, good, to a good movie. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Ron says all chocolate is good. All right, Ron. Yeah. We got you. Uh, last one, Alex, then we're going to jump in. Hot uh -huh. summers or cold winters? Hot summers or cold winters? I definitely hot summers i will take heat any day i'm always yeah. in a jacket yeah i'm yeah. thinking i got had a sense of humor i'll share more a little bit of where i ended up later on <laughs> well let's jump into this alex um so good to have you man thanks for joining us 
I've been really anticipating this conversation. Um, yes. Alex, you grew up in Rwanda. Um, tell us about that. Tell us about what life was like early on growing up in the beautiful country of Rwanda. Yeah. So growing up in Rwanda, it was so fun. I, uh, as a little boy, uh, I was raised by my grandmother. Uh, my mother had passed away when I was very little. Uh, she passed over HIV AIDS and I never knew who my father was. Mm -hmm. And so growing up, I remember my grandmother uh, had a little farm. Uh, she raised goats. So I was me and my, my brother and my sister. We are always, always chasing these little tiny goats in our, in our, in our house, uh, in, in our field. And I remember as a little boy, one of the things that I miss even up to today is climbing mango trees and uh, guava trees and picking off these, uh, uh, these fruits and eating them and just spending time playing and uh, just having a great, having that childhood. And then uh, going to school, I remember I went to a small little uh, kindergarten school that we would walk, actually, we would walk to kindergarten and walk back. So all the kids in the community, we would all meet together in a specific location, like in an open, uh, in a community area, and we would all walk together to school. And then after school closed, we would walk back to our own, to, to the loc to central location, then we would disperse and go to our own homes. But it was fun. It was uh, full of running and playing soccer. And my grandmother had a, a very good way to really challenge us. Um, I, I was always getting in trouble uh, because. Uh, no, not you, Alex. <laughs> she would, she would just, believe. She would send us to go uh, to go to the to the well to collect water, and we would we would get our our, our jerry cans and we would put them in line, and then we would play soccer. And three hours would pass by. And we just keep playing soccer and all of a sudden we would remember to go get water and we would go home. And then, of course, you know, we would uh, get disciplined. But it was, it was just a fun, fun, fun childhood that I uh, did, dearly miss uh, with, with her grandmother. Yeah, well, she sounds like yeah. a, an amazing lady. Um, yeah. So that's awesome. You know, it sounds like, you know, and I've been to different countries in Africa myself. And I can, you know, I yeah. can vividly see, you know, the kids gathering, running to school yeah. together. Obviously, playing soccer is huge, and they're yes. so good at it. Bare feet, obviously. Absolutely, yeah. It's the best way to Absolutely. play. Um, Alex, your entire childhood wasn't all fun. It wasn't all happy stuff. Yeah. Um, many of us, you know, here in the Western world, we when we hear Rwanda, we often think of the genocide of 1994. Um, and, and for us, you know, we heard about it. It was in a distant land, but for you, it was a reality. Um, and as a young boy, you sadly, you lost family members. Can you tell us, um, just walk us through, take some time and, and, and tell us about your experience, how old you were, what you saw, what you witnessed, um, what happened um, during that genocide, that horrific, horrific uh, atrocity that happened in our world. Can you tell us yeah. about that? Yeah. So uh, when the genocide started um, in 1994, it broke out. And uh, that is the main one that a lot of people have, have seen and read about, seen in the movies as well. But actually the genocide really started way back in 1800s, actually when the people of Rwanda uh, initially were divided by, uh, were divided into tribes during the colonial time. And during the division of the tribe, they would say that if you're tall and you're slim and you have a pointy nose, you would be a Tutsi. They would literally get a ruler and measure the length of your nose. Wow. And they would say, if you're very short and muscular built, that means you're Hutu. So hatred was created between uh, the Hutus and the Tutsis to the point where that hatred continued to grow. But in the 50s, a lot of the, uh, the people who, the Tutsis, some, many of them fled the country. And uh, when we got our independence, when Rwanda got its independence, the very first government that came on was considered to be, uh, to be a Hutu government. And this time, hatred had power now. Mm -hmm. And that hatred continued to grow. And in 1994, the Rwandan president was assassinated. And that became the spark. Uh, and from that was April 6th to July 4th, where uh, a million people were killed. And over 400,000 orphans were left uh, due to this genocide against the Tutsi tribe. Wow. And from all of this, uh, from this time, we were, it was just a rough time. Uh, really, uh, Satan came and built a nest in the country of Rwanda. Uh, wow. to the point where uh, a neighbor actually killed a neighbor 
uh, a husband killed a wife and her wife killed a husband because of that, that hatred that was ingrained in people's hearts. Wow. But and during this time, uh, I was six years old. And since my family, we were part of the Tutsi tribe, uh, we, literally the next day uh, we were attacked and uh, my grandmother uh, was killed and because we, we, we first went hiding in the morning because our neighbor came to us and told us what had happened. But um, uh, we came back and hid in the, in the house in the, in the morning, in the afternoon. And wow. before we knew it, we, we had people knocking on our door and they said, hey, all of you go outside and lie down. And that's when they would kill our grandmother and they would uh, tell us kids to go back inside the house. So as a six year old watching this happen, it was just, uh, it, we were in shock because we could not think that our own neighbor, a person who we knew by name, would actually do this to our grandmother. Wow. So after grandmother, they came looking for our uncle because he was known to be the one to provide for the family. Mm. Uh, when the genocide started, uh, the goal was to wipe out the young generation of Tutsis. And the other goal was to uh, destroy families, beginning with the head of the family. One of my uncle was known to be the head of the family. So they would come, and a hundred men would come looking for him. They couldn't find him when, once they looked inside the house because he had pulled himself on the springs of the bed. So when they were throwing their weapons under the bed, they, they didn't get to him, but they wow. left then. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy that, that they left, but three days later, uh, th unfortunately, three men with their weapons came back and said, he's under the bed, let him get out. The last words he told us and he told them, the last words he said was, please do not destroy the house. My kids need a place to live. Because they, were about, they didn't know, he didn't know if they were joking or not. So uh, he hesitated. And that's when they threatened to destroy the house. And so me and my brother, we are there. Our, our, our uncle just got killed. We we're, we're, were lost. The, the remaining uncle would grab the militias for the following week. And then eventually he, had to, he told us kids, to go to the city where our aunt lived. Because during, in the city, we, uh, our aunt lived there and it was a bit safer. So and a lot of the, our relatives in the villages were all coming to the city, running away from the city because uh, the killing began outside of the cities in the, in the, in the, in the villages. And um, this, so we get to the city and you know, there were so many incidences that happened that we mm -hmm. could have lost our lives. Uh, one specific moment that I remember uh, when, um, when we were living with our aunt, it was that a man snuck into the backyard where our whole family was. And when he got there, he looked at us and we see him, we're scared. And he takes his, his gun and he went to load. And in the process of loading, his magazine actually fell out of the gun. And when he was picking up, trying to reload, that's when my aunt, aunt, aunt's husband comes in the backyard and he asked the guy what he's trying to do. And he said, oh, no, I was just joking. I was just playing with him. But he was not there to joke around or to play wow. around because if his weapon would be loaded, um, we, we, wouldn't having this, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Wow. It, things got worse in the city. Eventually, everybody in the city had to run. We ran for a, a period of about two months altogether. And Rwanda is a very tiny little country in central east of, uh, of Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and uh, that country is known as the land of a thousand hills. And let me tell you, it lives up to its name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we climbed these hills with 2,000 of people were running. And this is the most humorous way that God saved my life, that I, I love to carry on God's humor. When we were running, I was six years old. I couldn't, I, my reaction as a little kid wasn't quick enough. I remember hearing this noise from a distance and I did not know what the noise was. And all of a sudden, I slipped and fell. Uh, when I fell, that noise missed my head by an inch. And I realized that that noise was a bullet. Oh, my goodness. And missed my head. Alex. Yeah, because I had slipped, I had fell in a cow pie. Oh. And that's what God used to save my life. You know, I slipped in a cow pie and fell down to the ground. And that's what God used to save my life. You know, oh. our God uh, is a mighty God who works in mysterious ways. But I, Mark, I always say that he works in gross ways as well. Sometimes I don't like to see the gross part. Wow. Yeah. But six year end, old, running for your old. life. I, I can't even, Alex, honestly, I can't even. 
Yeah, it, it was what, the fear you must have lived in. Yeah, it was rough. It was rough and running with 2,000 other people and just so many people running for their life. We couldn't even sit down and cook a meal because wow. every time you would uh, stop, you would hear commotion going on and you just leave everything. So even yeah. hunger was a weapon in itself because uh, we, our bodies were just beat, beat up running on adrenaline. Mm. But when, uh, when, when the genocide ended, uh, we were put in, an, my, my brother and I were put in an orphanage by our, our aunt and her husband had passed away right after the genocide because of illnesses. Mm. And she turned for the worse as well. And she wondered what would happen of me and my brother because at this time, um, our, our grandmother was gone. Uh, we, did, we didn't know where, where our other aunt and uncle were because they ran different, different parts of the country. Right. And so she decided to put us in this orphanage. Three months later, uh, she also passes away. So at wow. this time, we're left with no hope. We're, you know, we're living in a facility that was built for only 60 people. We had about 200, 250 children. Wow. And orphanages were packed. The whole country was in ruins. Uh, but during this time, it was quite an amazing time. Uh, right after the genocide ended, borders opened. And guess who one of, was one of the first organizations to be in the country? was uh, Samaritan's First. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, Alex, let's just recap. I know uh, Josiah just joined us and Ty. Yeah. Uh, Chris is watching. Uh, lots of people have joined us. So you had a, at first, you know, childhood was fun, running to school with all your friends. Your yeah. grandmother was raising you. Your mom had passed away from HIV AIDS. Um, yeah. The genocide begins and neighbor turning on neighbor, family members turning on each other. As a six-year-old boy, you watch your grandmother who was taking care of you killed in front of you. Um, and shortly after that, your uncle as well. And you, mm. you and your brother are on, on the run for the city. Yeah. as a little boy, just fearing for your life. A um, couple times, you know, coming close to death with, you know, guns being fired at you, whatnot. Now you're in an orphanage. How was that experience? Uh, living in an orphanage, you obviously didn't know anybody. It was a new home for you with all these other kids. Yeah. Living in an orphanage, it was, uh, it was a, a little safe, uh, safe heaven for us uh, at, that, at that time. But mm -hmm. all of us in the orphanage, since all of us 250 kids had lost our loved ones, had seen so much, uh, now that our bodies were not running on adrenaline, this is when uh, post-traumatic stress kicked in. Yeah. Because uh, now that we're not running, being scared, our minds were starting to process everything. And yeah. I remember specifically in the middle of the night, just kids, I mean, you could hear kids screaming of yeah. nightmares after nightmares. And wow. it was it, it was really hard to go. You didn't want to go to sleep. Yeah. And yeah. It was rough because uh, of that time. And the orphanages were packed. And orphanage the directors were doing their best to, you know, to put food on the table. And it, 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 was, you know, it was quite a, a, a tough time for the, even the directors who, you know, how do you deal with the um, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds who yeah. are just seeing their loved ones be taken away and how do you love on them and how, uh, how do you pour your love on them? They did their best they could. Mm -hmm. And we, we are thankful for the hard work that they did. Yeah, I can only, I mean, I've raised, you know, two kids, they're teenagers now, but I, you know, yeah. just as six and seven year olds, what, you know, a normal childhood has to deal with, but not yeah. 250 kids in an orphanage who have seen what most people will never see in their life in terms of trauma and, um, you know, killing and, and all of this horrific things before and, and people they love, their family members. Um, so the, so the, the genocide ends, um, like you said, horrifically, you know, a million people slaughtered, you know, yeah. um, just, you know, it takes my breath away to even talk about it. Um, and then the borders open up and you say Samaritan's Purse is one of the first organizations in um, which as a little boy means nothing to you until the day they come to your orphanage. What happened? Yeah. So they, oh, it was awesome. Uh, it, just, it's, it was a year later after I got into, uh, into the orphanage that uh, Samaritan's Purse brought, uh, came to our orphanage and they brought Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. Uh, you know, shoe boxes that look like kind of like this, like this one I'm yeah. wearing right now. Yeah. And so 
I remember when we were told to line up in the yard, all of us, 250 of us, and we line up in the yard and they said, today is a special day. Uh, today you're going to get a gift. And, you know, in the orphanage at this time, we're getting a little bit better. So now we're, uh, we're playing with the kids. We're getting to know the kids. So we run and we, we're beelining it for that line and we will line up. They hand out this gift and they say, do not open your gifts until oh. all of them have been handed out. You know, uh, some, some of us, uh, some of us who are impatient, uh, wanted to go be of first course. in line. We had to hold our present for about five minutes. That's oh, a long like time. Five hours for a little yeah, kid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we opened our shoeboxes together and all of us, all of us were screaming. Oh. This time was a, it was a different kind of a screaming. It wasn't a screaming that we were uh, scared or we were running for our lives. This wow. time was screaming because we could not contain the joy of receiving a gift, wow. um, a gift for the very, very first time in our lives. And it was so fun to hear, to see all of us pull out all the items and, uh, and share with our friends and say, hey, look what I've got, show me what you've got and seeing uh, the toys, the new toys we could play with, uh, the little bouncy ball, the, uh, the coloring book, the, the really unique pencils and colored pencils. Probably and, things you've never seen before, a lot of it. Yeah, some of the things we had yeah. never seen before, yeah. And one, uh, you know, one item that I actually had never seen before, had no idea what it was, it ended up being one of my favorite items. It was a candy cane, oh. you know? <laughs> I had no idea what it was, so I ate the candy cane with a wrapper on it, oh. you know? But uh, I shared that because it was, uh, it was one of my favorite. And, uh, you know, unfortunately today, we cannot pack that candy and toothpaste, you know, because they cause right. uh, problems, customer relations. Right. Uh, but, you know, without uh, any of the, uh, the candy cane, without any of the items, you know, the shoebox went deeper and yeah. planted the hope and love of Jesus Christ in my life. Uh, um, Alex, I, I never thought yeah. about it before, but you, you talk about, you know, the kids start to scream and we've seen, and probably a lot of people that are watching, and if you haven't, just Google Operation Christmas yes. Child. <laughs> Watch we've, a video. We've, seen, we've seen videos of these kids just becoming so excited and yelling, yeah. but it was so powerful what you just said. It was, it was a different kind of a screaming because you guys and a lot of the children in Rwanda in, in these early to mid 90s grew up yeah. screaming because they were running for their life. And now they're yeah. screaming out of joy Amen. that they've got this gift. Amen. Yeah, it was so special. It was so special. And we got to be excited. And, you know, um, Mark, the shoebox also planted that seed of hope and love of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. but, uh, another powerful uh, way that God used that shoebox gift in our lives is during this time in the orphanage, the orphanage director would give us a piece of paper to, and they would say, uh, um, to draw as a way mm. to help us process what we had seen. So right. kids, imagine what kids would draw. They would draw uh, machetes. They would draw um, you know, people without limbs because that's oh. what they'd seen. So when we get to receive that, uh, that gift you know, and see all the, all the little uh, coloring books and we color these... Uh, uh, let's say, for example, a, a figure of a uh, Mickey Mouse, and yeah. you carry it uh, with the new colors, uh, yeah. or or even Bible stories, maybe some of the coloring books. You know, all these fun items. We're creating new memories, new texture, so wow. that when we go to bed, uh, a new memory is implanted in our minds. Wow! And that is the uh, the childhoodness that the genocide had taken away from us. So the shoebox wow. reminded us to be boys and girls again uh yeah. it was powerful well and, and and we honestly we don't think about that if you've ever participated again if you're watching and you've packed a shoe box and it's oh uh, you know it's a nice few little gifts nice gesture nice yeah. you know compassionate thing you don't think of the power of you know potentially the kids that will receive this yeah. what they've been through in life and now this is rewriting their story like you yes. said giving them new memories new things to draw Yes. I mean, this is, these are things that we often don't think about as we give on one side, but the, the receiving end of it is so much, it's more than a shoebox is what you're saying. It is, it is, it is. And it's so fun. And, and you know, the orphanage directors were, were so uh, uh, 
as uh, were leading this as they shared with us about Jesus Christ and they used that shoe box as a great opportunity to, uh, to remind us of how much we are loved and reminding us that the people who pack those shoe boxes are thinking of us. They are praying yes. for us. Wow. And to know that it's a person who put that together for us. And that was a very great connection. Uh, but at that time, as little kids, we, uh, we quite didn't understand the whole big picture of what the Lord was doing. Sure. Uh, in my personal life, that seed of hope and love of Jesus Christ was planted. But of course, I'm a little kid. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm playing around. I enjoy the items. I love the items. I kept a hair comb for three years. Hmm. That's how important those items that, uh, that are packed in shoeboxes are. And uh, I remember I had in my shoebox even when I left the country and I kept it with me and I, I was so sad when I lost it. But hmm. today, uh, what I have, still have today from that shoebox is that hope and love of Jesus Christ. Wow. And, and I know as we've talked before, Alex, yeah. um, sometimes it's when you, and, and we're all like this, whatever we've gone through in life, it's, it's only when we come through some things that we look back and say, okay, God, God, you were at work and yeah. you were redeeming things. And, and again, the shoe box, it's not just about the shoe box, but it was about the greater imprint that it left in your life that, hey, you matter. You're not alone. God remembers you. You are loved. And it was just a small token to show you that. Now, I want to ask you about this. Man, so powerful, Alex. You went back to Rwanda to deliver shoebox gifts to children in that same orphanage that you grew up in. Yeah. What was that like? Uh, it was fun. It was fun. It was amazing being back in that orphanage. I bet. Standing in the same place that I stood as a little boy. Wow. This time, handing out a shoebox. Well, it was overwhelming. Uh, I I, yeah, it was overwhelming because I remember when we got to the orphanage and we saw the kids who were still there. Uh, some of them, um, uh, some of the older ones who had left, uh, who I lived with when I was in the orphanage, actually came, uh, came back, uh, came to kind of meet to help pass out the boxes. No way. And, yeah, and so it was really neat, uh, but it was overwhelming to really be there. And one of my favorite moment. Uh, on that trip, as I delivered shoeboxes in the same place I grew up in, was translating letters that people had written in, and put in the shoeboxes. Wow. And, and, and I, I remember, I have this picture when I translated, I was translating this letter for this boy, and he's intent listening well, and all of a sudden at the end, I, you know, the person said, we love you and we're praying for you, and the kid just smiles. Uh, and that's because that person who packed that shoebox gift loves that child mm -hmm. and pr is praying for that child. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the kid who I was translating the letter for received it well in his heart. And wow. that's what made him smile. Wow. You, someone loved him. Your mind must have went back to you were, you were there. You know, that yeah. was you. And how, you know, and we, I mean, we call this and, you know, this show every Thursday night, always good news. And, yeah. um, but honestly, like this is the gospel message in such a real practical, simple way, how God redeems and how, you know, the Bible says he, he works all things together for good. And sometimes, honestly, it doesn't seem like much good can come from this. I mean, your story is horrific. It's, it's horrible. It's tragic. It's, it's heart wrenching to hear uh, what you went through. Um, let me ask you this, a couple more questions. This is so good. Yes. Um, what would you say to people tonight that, um, that are packing shoe boxes and participating, or they haven't, and now they're hearing a little bit about it? What, any encouragement just to cheer them on and maybe the power of, of what they're doing? Yeah. Uh, for the person who is packing Operation Christmas Child boxes and the person who wants to really start, I, uh, I want to encourage you that each and every shoe box that is packed uh, represents a child, uh, a child mm. like me, as a seven-year-old living in an orphanage in Rwanda, receiving that gift really reminded me of God's love. Yeah. And that's what each and every shoebox that is done. And uh, it's so beautiful that since, since 1993, when, the ministry, when Samaritans first took on the project of Operation Christmas Child, uh, there has been over 178 million shoeboxes packed. But wow. that's, a, that's a lot, right? You, that's a lot. But the, yeah, that's a lot. But there's way more children who are able to receive uh, shoe boxes who have never heard about the name of Jesus. Yeah. And that is why we, uh, we encourage if you uh, encourage the people who are want to pack more, 
you know, if yeah. we inc- if you packed one more ba- one box last year, pack two this time because that equals to two children yeah. who get to hear about Jesus Christ. And we 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 have faithful partners in uh, more than 160 countries um, that use these shoe boxes as a gospel opportunities. Yeah, uh, because it's not just uh, hey, let's give a child uh, the school supplies, the hygiene items, the toys, yeah. and then leave them there like that, but the pastor in that country uh, partners with the ministry, with the Operation Christmas Child, and they get this tool. Yeah. They go into villages that, you know, many people would never want to go in, into. Right. Uh, they go to places where they may, uh, you know, they could lose their lives. Right. And, but God is using these shoe boxes, going deep um, uh, in the places where we can never go. And wow. God is using them as a light uh, to remind children that yeah. they are loved no matter what they're going through. And so if you're, if you're thinking of packing a box, that is the good news of Jesus Christ you'll be sharing with the child. Yeah. And, oh, it's so um, good. Yeah. So it's good. I, to, I, go ahead. Yeah. So. It's a way to send the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to be a missionary, to do evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication w- right in your own area, in your own, in your own home. And, yeah. making it, and it's fun, too. It's really fun. Yeah. Well, I just, I was, I was just going to say, you know, some people, you know, can be, let's call it out. Some people can be critical and say, well, what's a shoebox with a few gifts, yeah. you know, if they're living in poverty or if they're, yeah. and, and that's all true. I get that. But the fact yeah. of the matter is for a small child, for this, this moment in time, yeah. they receive a gift that is fun. Yes. And the message mm-hmm. that comes with it is you are not forgotten. God yeah. loves you. Somebody that you've never met is praying for you and cared enough to take the time to run around and get these gifts and then the gospel is presented and these kids are embraced and loved. And so it's so much bigger than just a shoebox that we might take for granted. Um, so good. I, I want to ask you this, and I know we're, we're taking a bit of time tonight, but this is, this is a powerful part of the story too, Alex. I want you to tell us, I believe it was in 2013 on when you went back to Rwanda. Mm-hmm. Um, you went back to the prison and you met with the man who killed your family. Yeah. And you prayed with him and you offered him forgiveness, which I can't even imagine how emotional that must have been and how, what a holy moment that was for you and, and ultimately for this man. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, when, when I received that Operation Christmas Church back as a little boy, uh, we shared how it really planted those seeds of, of hope and love of Jesus Christ in my life. And uh, I remember when I was living in Uganda and uh, um, I was, had lived in Rwanda and was in Uganda, that's when I started to realize that um, I will never have peace until I invite Jesus Christ in my life. Mm. And uh, at this time I was blaming him and because I was starting to read the Bible and the Bible would say that we are all creating the image of God, that God loves us so much so that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die right. for us. Then I would ask in my mind, and I would ask, actually, I'd drive the people, the chaperones who are with me crazy, because I would ask him, why would then, with a God who loves us so much so that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer, watch while a million of his children are being killed in Rwanda? Mm. And why would he take away my grandmother, my uncle, my mother, my father? So I lived in this bondage of blaming him for everything. The more I blamed him, the more I missed out on the miracles that he did to protect me. The wow. miracles being the, when the, man, the gunman, uh, his gun didn't work, falling in a cow pie and going to an orphanage and receiving a Christian Christmas child shoebox gift that reminded me of love, reminded me yeah. to be a boy again. Yeah. And when I realized those miracles, I gave my heart to the Lord. And then, um, you know, we surrendered to him. I surrendered my life to him, but I didn't want him to touch my life, the deepest part of my life. Mm. And it was years later of praying, a God sent me uh, one of the chaperone challenge men said, Alex, what happened in your life that you're able to be here today? Tell me your story. The more I shared that testimony, the more I realized how therapeutic that felt. And she, that chaperone asked me and said, hey, Alex, what if you'd sit with the person who has caused you the most pain in your life? What would you do? So that question launched my healing process. Mm. But in 2008, I actually went to Rwanda for the first time to figure out if I could be able to meet with this man. And it didn't happen. The only two people who didn't show up was the guy who came my grandmother and the guy who came my uncle. Mm. 
Mm. And in 2013, uh, when we were in Rwanda that time with delivering boxes, it was so special to be able to go to the prison. And it was just a miracle how God worked it out and found out that the man who had killed my grandmother fled, but the man who had killed my uncle was still in the prison. And, you know, I was sweaty. I was in tears. I was, I was so nervous. Uh, but we got to meet with him and I sit next to him and I would ask him, why did you do what you did? And he would say, I don't remember some of the things that we did. We're just following orders. Mm. And uh, I'd ask him, do you remember me? And he'd say, no, I don't remember you specifically, but I remember three children being there. The, the three children were me and my brother and my sister. In a moment, I would be in tears, but I know that God took my healing process at a different level. Mm. And, you know, uh, the reason that so one of the things that drove me to do this, you know, a, a prayer in Matthew chapter 6, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, it's in the Lord's Prayer where it says that forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Yeah. That really challenged me because I was thinking, I was nine years old and I was, I was praying for God to forgive me, inviting him in my heart. And I would think, oh my goodness, how can I forg- ask him to forgive me yet I'm not willing to forgive even the people who cause me pain. Wow. But I didn't want to receive that. I didn't want to accept that. But, you know, in verse 12, 14 of Matthew chapter 6 says, uh, for if we forgive others their trespasses, uh, our, your, if you forgive your trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Wow. And that continued to challenge me. And it was through the discipleship of people who came in my life mm-hmm. and lived out the gospel in my life and challenged me. And that's what led me to be in that prison and wow. praying for that man. But all of that goes back in my whole journey, it goes back to that day when I was seven years old, leaving wow. that orphanage, lost all hope, that an Operation Christmas Child Shoebox gift planted that seed. Wow. And reminded me that I was loved. And wow. I wanted to remind that man that he is also loved, not less than me, not more than me. And, uh, and I'm not loved anymore. We're loved the same. And we all deserve the love of Jesus Christ. He came and died for us. Wow. And that is the good news that is, is sent with each and every Operation Christmas Child Shoebox gift. Wow, Alex. And I, I've seen the video of that encounter where you were weeping and praying that this man would experience the love and kindness of Jesus. And I'm just yeah. overwhelmed um, by the strength that you have, but obviously that the gospel has transformed your life. Yeah. Um, and, and, and God is using you now in ways, you know, somebody asked where you live now. Uh, you're in North Carolina. You came to the yeah. state. That's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> but God is using you and your story to encourage others and to speak hope and to speak life and, You know, your story is um, incredibly painful, but hopeful because of Christ. And, you know, you're right. We are, you know, the forgiveness we receive from Christ is the forgiveness we are to offer Uh, because we've all been hurt. Some, some of us feel like, man, we've, we've not been done anywhere near the damage and the hurt that you've been done. And, you know, but, but nonetheless, all of us carry different things and it's not easy, but it's important. And, uh, I just want to encourage everybody that's watching tonight. You know, if, if you're carrying unforgiveness, somebody's hurt you, somebody's done you wrong, um, you know, it's okay to just talk that through with the Lord. Let, tell him it's not easy. Ask for his help. Um, you know, the Bible says this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And it's just the more we get the understanding that Jesus forgives us. Amen. Past, present, future, we are forgiven and we accept his forgiveness, we then can forgive others. And, you know, we've all done wrong, and yet God still sent his son, and he was brutally murdered for some, you know, yeah. and, and wrongfully murdered, um, yeah. but raised, but was raised from the grave. And, and that's where we put our hope. And, you know, the Bible says that we're to forgive as the Lord forgave us. So important. And Alex, yeah. I just, man, I tell you, I'm just so overwhelmed by your story. And I don't know if I've ever looked at Operation Christmas Child in shoeboxes. I don't think I'll ever look at it the same again. And I, I know it's a wonderful thing to do, but I think it's a new level now hearing your story and the impact it's made on you. And hey, everybody that's watching, it's not too late for this year. If you want to participate in Operation Christmas Child, you can pack a shoebox, 
for a child just like Alex. You don't know the impact that it's going to make. That's the beauty of, of partnering with God is that he can yeah. take a shoebox and do a miracle through it. Uh, a miracle that we're watching and listening to and hearing from tonight in Alex's life, SamaritansPurse.ca. If you go online, um, you can pack a shoebox. You can have one done for you. You can just make the donation online and have it done for you. Um, but I want to challenge you, just do it. Don't, don't think of any more excuses. Just do it. Get your church to do it. Get your friends. Get your workplace to do it. Uh, make that donation online, SamaritansPurse.ca, because who knows? Who knows where that will end up? Who knows what story God is writing, and this will be a part of it, like um, we heard from Alex tonight. Alex, you are an awesome, awesome young man, and um, man, I can see God in you, and and just, you know, the way you communicate, um, clearly the gospel has transformed your life, and God is using you in incredible ways. And I just want to say on behalf of everybody that's watching and the Billy Graham Association here in Canada, thank you for sharing your story tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to share. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, um, it's a privilege, and I share that, all of that, each and every person who's had this to, uh, for the glory of the Lord, uh, because, uh, you know, and without him, I wouldn't be here, and we give him the glory, and we, we, we want more children to hear of that good news of Jesus Christ through a, a simple shoebox gift. That's amazing. Samaritanspurse.ca. Um, please, everybody, go online, check it out, participate this year. Let's really make an impact all around the world. Alex, God bless you. Thank you so bless much you for too, joining Mark. us. Okay, bless take care. Bye-bye.